On this edition of InCycle, we catch up with a GC man for the future, New Zealand's George Bennett. I've got very high ambitions, but I'm also need to keep my feet on the ground and focus on just, just working hard and, you know, sweet things come like California. With the 50th anniversary of his death on Mont Ventoux, we remember Tom Simpson. He's ended up almost like a martyr by the fact that uh, he's, he's really said I'd kill myself. He say to me I'd kill myself on the bike to win the Tour de France, you know. I could die to do really well in that. And he, he really meant it. But first, we're at the Giro Rosa with Elena Ciccini. This year, Giro started from my region, so it was kind of strange because last Thursday I was still at home and my, and my teammates were coming from all the parts of the world and traveling already from one day and I was like, I said to my boyfriend, oh, it's, it's kind of strange because I have the team presentation in two hours and I'm still at home, I had dinner at home and everything. Giro is different from any other race because everything can happen until the very last, last moment and you need to be really focused and ready. You need to be here in great shape if you want to do a result because everyone is racing so aggressively. It's just so good, you know, to have this race in my country. I, I have not the chance to race so often in my home soil, so that's kind of special. She is a really, really determined when we are at home, all the training she do, all specific, all what she hit, everything. She is really professional, so uh, she prepared really well this Giro Rock. My fan club is, um, let's say, half of the village, <laughs> because I live in a village that uh, counts only 300 people. So they saw me growing up, and uh, some years ago they decided to start a sort of fan club that would follow me when they can in the races near home. And uh, it's always um, so special. So they have still these orange jerseys uh, from when I was junior. So they, they kept that color. And in my opinion, it's really nice because you can see it from far. It was also nice to have these three stages in the weekend so they could, uh, could follow me. And Hannah did an impressive sprint. I know some of them. Uh, they are racing with uh, cycling clubs in my region. First of all, I say to them, yeah, it's not so far Giro Rosa from you because they are, I think, 13 or 14 years old. So I just say, you have to wait four or five years and then we can race together or against. I'm quite sure that some of them will be my competitors. And of course, almost all the questions that they make me, I just answer, you need to have fun now just to enjoy your sport and all will, will come. Yeah, maybe it's not so good to go Cycling is really inside my family because my dad did it and my aunt. So I was just put on a bike when I was six and I could not uh, choose. But um, it was never a stress for me, you know, a sort of enjoyment. And uh, then it became even more a job and now here I am. I love her because uh, we do all together. When we spend time together, we are uh, always happy. I try to make her really every, every time with a smile because uh, uh, we see we stay together only when we are at home um, from the race and it's not a lot of days. So we, we won't really enjoy these days and maybe also for that I'm here now. <laughs> Have a support in race like that, a really long time out of home is really, really important. And uh, uh, she can she can be also more determined on the race, on the bike, when she have uh, Attila and his family around. And uh, I think they do a good a good move to do all the Giro with her. And uh, yeah, it's nice, really nice. Oh, it was a present from uh, my boyfriend uh, in Chris, uh, 2015 Christmas. It was I really wanted a dog, but now actually my, my parents are uh, their owners because I'm always away. And he's really in love with my dad. He's really famous in the peloton because you can't imagine how many girls are asking me, oh, is that your dog? I really want the same dog. Because, you know, French Bulldog is kind of 
funny dog, in my opinion, because they have that face, and I know that he's in good hands. And um, yeah, he, they are having a sort of uh, camping holidays now to follow me in Giro. It's something um, really special because for me, they are the most important people in my life. So it's, uh, you know, to know that they are in a climb or uh, waiting for me, it gives me some extra motivation. Sometimes I say to myself, I'm not here just to, I need to show something and to make them proud. Of course, because I'm 25 now, so I really think that I need to start doing something important in cycling, even if, you know, sometimes I look to some rankings and I say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm still in the young part of, uh, of women's cycling, but um, I can't let the chance go uh, anymore because I'm not 20 anymore. I just need to find a balance, but I think it's something that will come with my uh, physical maturity and experience and everything. I think that one day this circle will close and finally I, I, will, I will win also. We have nothing to lose, so if one day we just try to attack, 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 and then we blow up, it's fine. So it's just part of, uh, of our plan. And actually, I am understanding here that the, more, the braver you are on your bike, and more results can come. With solid performances over the last 12 months, Team Lotto NL Jumbo have a climber who's on his way to the top. He's already brought the team its biggest GC victory in recent seasons. And now he's starting to make overtures towards the top 10 of Le Tour. Hi, my name's George Bennett. I'm 27 years old. I was born in Nelson, New Zealand. I'm a professional cyclist with Team Lotto NL Jumbo. It's, it's been an exciting few years actually, especially last year, last half of last year, things really started getting rolling. And then uh, they came to a pretty bad halt with the glandular fever at the end of last year. But then, yeah, when I've been put a number back on in Abu Dhabi and it's picked up where I left off really. In New Zealand, I was so motivated for the new season that I was training five hours, six hour rides, but I was also going rock climbing with friends and, and you know, going on all sorts of missions everywhere. And, I mean, I had a great time, but it catches up with you. And, uh, you know, when we train hard up here, we live like monks. We get up, we eat, we train, have a massage, and sit on the bed for the rest of the day. There's a huge thing that's developing and, and finding my place and confidence and things. And this year's already been big for that. I've had a yeah, top 10 Abu Dhabi and Catalonia, and then every race, actually, except for Basque, which I was 11th had a badly timed puncture and then yeah California was special, it was the first race I've ever won. Yeah I mean when I think about that I guess you get like goosebumps thinking about winning a race. Instead of being complacent I feel like it, you want to chase more now you know. In winning the Tour of California, Bennett became the first New Zealander to win the general classification at a UCI World Tour cycling event. I only told two people I thought I could win. I told my coach and I told my girlfriend. And uh, yeah, they both actually believed it. I mean, it's weird, I believed I could win it, but I look back and sort of can't believe I've won it. It's a, it's a weird sensation. But I'm not getting ahead of myself. It's not like I'm going to the Tour de France now and saying, okay, I have, I've been top 10 in the world tour, I'm gonna be top, I can be top 10 in the tour or something. I've got very high ambitions, but I'm also need to keep my feet on the ground and focus on just working hard and, you know, sweet things come like California. I mean, that was an amazing experience and I, I want more of that. The reality is I'm still in a team with Steven Kroeswijk, Primoz Roglic and Robert Kessing. There's young guys coming through as well and I don't know who they'll get for next year, but... Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe some smaller races, I'll have more opportunities um, or more chances where I'm sort of a co-leader in some chances, but... At the end of the day, I'm, I also know that there's still a lot of really good riders above me in, the, in terms of skill and ability and hierarchy in the team, and so I know I, I still have to get my hands dirty, and, and I'm happy with that. You know, I like, I, I like doing that. That's what I've done for the last four or five years of my career, and it's only been in recent times where I'm getting these opportunities, and um, I think it just makes it more important that when you do get one, you take it. In New Zealand, we're big, strong, flat, 
riders. That's why we have so few climbers. You look at our pros, all of them, Jack Bauer, Fuelly, Bevan, Scully, Novi, all these guys are just maybe the strongest domestiques there are. And I think that's why New Zealand riders have such a good reputation as, uh, you know, who's gone before us as well, you know, Ralston and Julian Dean and these guys, Henderson, lead out men and great domestiques because they're just big, powerful guys. And uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't get that memo. <laughs> Three years in with Lotto and El Jumbo, Bennett has another year to run on his contract. But in spite of the time based in Holland, he hasn't found the language the easiest to pick up. As you as you it, we can Netherlands praten, but I think uh, we have a few problems. <laughs> I mean, I've always loved languages. I mean, it's, as I said, it started when I was racing in France for a few years. Back then, I could speak pretty good French. I was in an Italian team in Cannondale, and they only spoke Italian. And then, yeah, I live in Spain, so you have to pick up a bit of that. And then I came to Lotto NL, and my first year pro, we had 25 guys in the team. And there was me and 24 fluent Dutch speakers. And uh, so, again, it's just the, the same thing. If you want to know what's happening in the race, you better understand some Dutch. I can't really speak it well because I never ever practice, but I can understand more or less all of it unless I'm really talking about something philosophical. <laughs> I think it's important in being in a Dutch team to embrace the Dutch culture and the fact that we have Dutch sponsors and we have Dutch trainers and, and it's the heritage of the team is Dutch. I think that's it's special, you know, it opens a lot of doors for me um, in terms of being friends with people and seeing parts of the world I'd never see. Happy to embrace it. As people, we shouldn't just say Tom was a bad guy, Tom was a good guy. He was Tom. He was many different men. There were many different Tom Simpsons. He was a great champion, but he was flawed. You'd say Ankatil was a great champion, but he was flawed. Copy, the same. We have to sort of, first of all, we have to tell ourselves, this isn't going to be simple. These are human beings. Fundamentally, human beings aren't simple. My name is Andy Rogers and I'm captain and chairman of the Isle of Cycling Club and uh, I've been for the last number of years. Obviously you can see how many people's turned out for this morning for Tommy Simpson's memorial ride and I think that it's especially uh, a poignant year this year, we've been 50 years since Tommy died on Von Tool, and we all know that. And obviously you can see the legacy that Tom's left. When I was in Belgium, a lot of people uh, talked about Tom Simpson and I said, oh, I'm from, you know, I'm from Rotherham, oh, where's that? Oh, it's near, near Sheffield, it's near Doncaster. And they go, Doncaster, and they go, oh, yeah, Tom Simpson. And they didn't know Tom Simpson was from, you know, Doncaster and Harworth and this, that. So it, it, it was always nice to, to be, you know, thought of in that way. So, yeah, nothing like Tom Simpson was, but, um, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have a bit of fun today and see how the racing goes, riding goes. <laughs> When Tom started going out on club runs with the, the Harwith and District Cycling Club, they called him the Four Stone Copy because he had a, a great big beak of a nose like Fausto. He looked very unhealthy, again like Fausto, and he was very little, again like Fausto. Plus also, he obviously had superlative ability to hang on in spite of the fact he, he, he would be suffering like a dog. I got the impression he had built-in speed. And when I come to race with him in road races, 
over in Yorkshire, you know. He seemed to be okay up to 70, 80 mile. After that, he didn't seem to have the strength. He was never very muscular, he was always like quite slight, you know. And uh, I could always beat him over that, you know, but for the shorter distances, he could seem to out sprint anyone. As a teenager, he was very, very clear headed and very lucid about what he wanted to achieve and how he wanted to go about achieving it. Simpson wanted to go abroad from an early age. He didn't place a great deal of value on racing in Britain. It wasn't that rare to go to France. I mean, it was, it was a lot harder to go to France because obviously it was, you know, the communications were far more difficult. If you wanted to go to a cycling club in France, you had to write to them a letter and then when, how long would it take to get an answer, you know? Today, the sport of cycling is very short of personalities. It's very short of distinctive characters. Well, back in the 50s and the 60s, if you wanted to make money, you would want to win races, but you, you were, your market value depended very directly on, ha on your image and your, what they called notoriety, you know, so how well known you were. And therefore, if you turned up and you put on a funny hat and pretended to be an English gentleman with an umbrella or whatever, you'd make, you, you know, the, the agent would remember this and think, oh, that's Simpson, yeah, we'll give him 150 quid, not 100 quid or whatever. And that was how you made your money. But the thing about Simpson was he knew, as well as to be a showman, as well as, get, as well as being a showman, the other thing that would bring in big, big contracts was big, big wins. So it's quite noticeable that every year he's winning something big. So Tour of Flanders 61, Yellow Jersey in the Tour 62, Bordeaux Paris 63, Milan Serena 64, Worlds in 65, Paris Nice in 67. The point about those victories is that they give you that market value. So Lombardy in 65 as well. He was clearly a one-day rider. Um, and that meant he had to ride the tour as a one-day rider would, looking for stage wins, looking for a spell in New Jersey. Well, he'd only ridden one really good tour, and that was 62. And even there, he faded towards the end. In 62, he was holding the podium, you know, a few days out from Paris, but had a, had a nasty crash. Um, he tended to crash quite often, and because he was just very, you know, he was reckless. But he tended to, to fall apart in the tour over the years. You know, the pattern was that he would be extremely aggressive early on, and then he'd fall apart later. That was the pattern in, in his tours, which is why, you know, what happened in 1967 it, f it, it does fit this pattern, unfortunately, um, in the most extreme way. We finished the stage at Marseille, or near Marseille, and um, I had to like lift Tom off the bike, and um, we kind of helped him up to the room, and he was sick as a dog. He came back and he told me he'd been sick in the, in the toilet, you know. Next morning, he woke up and he was bright as a button. He looked better than himself. He had a full big meal, because he was obviously hungry, you know. We're not eating the night before. And, uh, and he was fine, we were clowning about. We went down by the um, marina in Marseille, and then we were jumping on and off one or two of the boats like a yacht. Tom was never afraid. Nobody ever thought anything of the Vonto. He'd been fairly flat anyway. You always came to it on the flat. The only thing Tom hated was the crickets. It, it looks scary to me now. I've ridden it three times. There was no air on the Mont Vonto. There was no wind. It was really horrible, eerie, like, you know, the last eight kilometres. Uh, it's an old volcanic mountain, and like the, the old volcano is like burnt white by the sun, you know, and you, it looks like a desert. On the bike, he was very quiet. He kept saying like he's going to attack uh, on the on the Vonta. We all knew that. And then the next minute, um, we're on about the second. We've done a big ramp, and he saw um, Amar, and I think it was uh, Julio Jimenez. He saw them, and he went. And so I'm climbing, like, way down 
at least five or six minutes down on Tom. But because Tom had been dropped a bit and then he'd weaved about and been on and off the bike, I was more or less there when he was just getting the oxygen mask. I think Harry Hall had finished the uh, breath of life, you know. There's about a hundred people around and I pushed my way in, you know, and I could see him like, and I could look down and his eyes were like, like glazed and like looking into space. Jean Bobet, a journalist um, working on the race, was told me how, you know, the, at the morning, you know, in the morning at the start, you know, <laughs> Tom stuck out his tongue and showed him the pills on his on his tongue, you know. Amphetamines were found in his bloodstream and, and in the pockets of his jersey. And he'd obviously taken alcohol during the stage because that's been documented by Colin Lewis. And that's a pretty toxic mixture in any case. To do that and then ride it with Vontu in that immense heat, um, that's a massive risk. He's ended up almost like a martyr by the fact that uh, he's, he's really said I'd kill myself. You say to me, I'd kill myself on the bike to win the Tour de France, you know. I could die to do really well in that. And he, he really meant it. After about six months, you'd got over the, the upset of it all. Um, I, I, but it still stayed in your mind. It was still deep in your mind that you, you, you didn't want to like to think that someone had taken a mate away and something like the Tour de France, in all its innocence, could take the life of a person away. He's a guy who was a great champion and he, and he died through, through, through the use of amphetamines in an, you know, in an injudicious way. He died through cheating effectively. I mean, but that doesn't mean he was a bad guy. It doesn't mean he's a guy that we should disassociate ourselves with. We should look at the good qualities that he had. He clearly had qualities that made him great. He was a great cyclist, but he was flawed. That's all for this week. Join us next time on InCycle, but until then, keep up to date with us across social media.